Greetings from Hilton Spaces. Hello, I'm Merritt Malik Plum with the Energy Center and Thrive Yoga and Wellness. Hello there, my name is Jennifer Dixon. We are so glad to have you in our weekly podcast and video blog, vlog, like the youngsters are calling it. <laughs> I sound ancient. You sound ancient. <laughs> I haven't heard the, ancient, the youngsters say it. So how ancient am I? We are ancient beings, ancient That's sentient beings. Wis wisdom exudes. So, yeah. <laughs> so today we are going to kind of summarize we over the last several weeks we have been discussing the first two limbs of yoga we spent yeah. five six six weeks covering the yamas and then we have spent the last actually it was a little bit more than five weeks because we did uh some extra podcasts in the middle of it so probably the last eight weeks covering the niyamas the second limb of yoga and today we are going to summarize those five topics. Now, do you want to kind of summarize what niyama means? Yeah, so the five niyamas are constructive tools for cultivating happiness, self-confidence, and also developing the opportunities to practice them, not only on the mat, but in our daily lives. So we'll just, just it's kind of like spirituality in action to me working with the niyamas and becoming more present with these five principles the first of which is saucha saucha which means uh, purification cleanliness. purity right yeah and, so, it, and oh, it includes not only cleansing the body but cleansing the mind and the spirit it's it's said to be not only the foundation of our physical body health but it's a doorway for deeper connection to the internal being and the eternal presence that we work to get to through our yoga practice and through our practice of the yamas and niyamas yep and it's not just the physical asana practice but also the other aspects of it that meditation helps to clear our minds the pranayama right the breath work and the chanting, it helps to, to clear your mind, strengthen your lung capacity on the physical realm, but then there's also that, that uh, subtle bodies realm. Sorry, and the, and the Kundalini energy that purifies through the heat. Of it all. So, so when we, as we have gone through these, has anything, and now that we've had a few weeks to simmer on the idea of Salcha purity, has anything kind of hit you pro in a profound way? About purification? Mm -hmm. Be or purity? I think this time, you know, we're, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Everyone is moving through these times so differently. I have found some peace and solace in purity and simplification of things. I found the not constant stimulation purifying and cleansing for my soul. And I've received clarity through that purification in how I'm choosing to move through, through things. And so that, that's been huge for me. And, you know, I think when we talked about purification initially, this stuff wasn't really going on. <laughs> No, it wasn't. That was bad. I'm looking back at it now. I'm looking at it now from a completely different perspective. Like just in five weeks, how, well, I guess it's been longer than five weeks since we did this because we pre-recorded these, but to look at the journey from back here and all the changes that happened so rapidly, that's one of the blessings for me is the, the cleansing that the, the silence and the simplicity has brought. One of the things that I learned while we were studying Salcha, and don't forget, we've been doing, uh, reading along with the Yamas and the Niyamas by Deborah Adele with this entire conversation 
I want to make sure we give a shout out to let the all everybody know one of the tools we've been using, right? But um, so one thing that she kind of highlighted really big actually, and it spoke to me, said being pure with ourselves means we are not afraid of our thoughts or our feelings, and we do not have to hide anything from ourselves. And that's been huge for me because this entire COVID crisis combined with the, we also had the tornado on Easter. I've had some, some thoughts that weren't necessarily the best thoughts at all. Of that course. I say, oh, we but, all have. Yeah, exactly. And so like dealing with the recognition, like, does this thought serve you? Does this thought, is this thought a beneficial thought? If it is, then let's follow it. If it's not, then, and try to deal and let it go and not be, and not dwell on it. And that was one of the things that I had been working on personally, because with all of the emotions of being a small business owner, trying to keep things going, the, you know, the tornado, kids at home, all of that sort of thing, stuff like the, the thoughts just were crazy and trying to accept and, and, and accept them. And then we'll talk about this in a minute, surrender to them and then move on. Don't live in it. And don't you find though, that when you are able to release that negative thought that you do feel a cleanse, a cleansing, a purity from that release, yes. once you get there, like we had for me, it's a journey to that place. But once I get there, I feel clean. Yes, for sure. <laughs> lighter, lighter, cleaner and lighter. Yes. Like after you've had a really great, uh, a really great long bath and you scrubbed everything. Yeah, it, it feels right. Great. Yep. And that's the beauty of the, the niyamas is as we get to that surrender into them, how, how we're moving from just such a more beautiful place. But the journey there is also beautiful and also necessary. So, so we're you we're doing it with non-judgment and contentment and surrender and non-judgment. You know, like I said, the ego things begin to melt and we we move more into that space. Agree. So, okay, we can't talk about all of them that long. So let's move on. But I do think it's important just to wrap up, Salcha, what you said about you know, when you get to that higher place of perception, how, you know, you're choosing to shift that thought and in choosing that you're in alignment with Saucha. So. Good. That was beautiful. So what's number two? Santosha. Santosha. Contentment. Contentment. Yes. That one's hard for right now. I'd say for a lot of folks, wouldn't you? I think everyone is cycling in and out of contentment, but I think that people are touching some very deep truths within themselves right now. And that, you know, even though there's a lot of fear and fear is going to cycle too, everyone I know is touching some level of contentment. Interesting. I've struggled with it personally being okay with the way things are and settling in with, it was like right when I got used to the new norm, we had the tornado and now it's the new norm in light of the tornado and things starting to open up. And I, it's a daily struggle being content, but we, we knew this from the first time because I'm always looking forward, always planning. So contentment, Santosha is a hard one for me. Not that I'm not thankful for where we are right here and now, but it's always like, really? Really? Well, We're still dealing with this. And even as we do that, you know, contentment doesn't always mean happiness and bliss, right? It comes more from the experience of just radical acceptance of what is even as you are looking to the future and making plans for the future, also just being content and, and maybe what you're saying is that you aren't there, but I kind of see that you do touch this. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah. 
and I kind of lost the point I was trying to make, but, but the key to this Niyama as I see it is when we understand that the power of our contentment comes from our choice to just be present. And if you need to be a person who's always putting energy toward the future, I think we all need to be doing that, but doing it from this, this wellspring of contentment and being just happy and accepting of just where things are and also doing that. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And, and finding the, it's the finding of the peace for me that I am working on. And it's a daily thing. Like what other problem needs to be solved. And, and that's where I think the, the root of the contentment is the peace regardless what is going on around it being content regardless with all the chaos yes and and i've touched on this throughout and you know you said one thing and it's really just a paradigm shift it can happen in a second that you were you're find finding happiness or you said something about finding it and when we when we cease the trying and realize that that's just what we are. All these niyamas are all components of our original nature. And so when mm. we stop looking and finding and searching and realize that that's just, that's what we are. That is what you are. That is what you are. Then it's, it shifts from more of a moving and an experience rather than you're trying, you're grasping, you're instead of rowing against the current just letting the current current take let you. go of those I, oars let go of the oars sister yep exactly no i would agree with that and you know so many it. of us are are paddling upstream you know we're fighting the currents and rowing our boat just as hard as we can upstream and there's nothing up there you've already been there like just you know, it's sometimes it's easier said than done. I'm good at preaching it and I'm not always good at being there. So I know it's true though. I know it's yeah. true. No exactly. one can dissuade me from knowing that it's true. So I, be I believe it. I totally agree. And it's letting go of that thing, that part of us that feels like we need to seize control because that may or may not have been me in a, in a previous life and go letting go of the oars and just going with it. And that all goes with it. These are all character traits that you recognize. And like, I recognize, I see it and yeah. let go, let go. Like, like Elsa says. Yeah. And you know, sometimes we'll let it go on one level and then something will come up. We'll just pick up those oars and start doing it again. And so it, like I always say, it's, it's the nature of the journey. Like you have to go through it to get past it. Agreed. So. Agreed. And so that moves us to self, to tapas, which means self-discipline. It's not the little Spanish meals. No, no. We, we covered that thoroughly in the first video, Jennifer. We know you I, don't like it. I, but, but I do, do like, like the yoga tapas. I do. I do. So what have you, after we've explored it and now we're kind of a few weeks, I guess a month or so past it. What have you discovered? Well, self-discipline, top is a self-discipline, first of all. What have you discovered in light of this study, this personal development, and this COVID crisis? So the literal definition of top is heat. And so I work with this energy more from that standpoint than get up at nine o'clock, do this every day, that, that kind of self-discipline. Um, more to the heat in my body and the inflammation in my body. And I've been working with the top as the heat, the fire energy to cleanse the heat that is inflammation into a more productive heat that will fuel my body, mind, and spirit. Interesting. I struggled because, you know, when we talked about it the first time, you said something about my self discipline and I have this in my head where I'm, this is what I, I'm a yoga person first and foremost. I do this, 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 and my asanas. And when the COVID crisis happened and then that week of the tornado, my asana practice just died for like 10 days. It was all, I taught a few classes and that was basically all I was practicing. And I 
felt lost for a moment because that was where I found kind of my identity, if you will, in that disciplined practice every single day. And what came in its place was a stronger meditation practice and a, a stronger breathing practice, sitting and being practice. And so what I've learned is your self-discipline, like the seasons that change, if you have those roots in place, those habits in place, they're still going to be there, just the discipline things might change. And so in my case, the, the emphasis of the super strong physical practice went to the wayside for a little while because of all of the stress, um, the, the energy being put into maintain, rebuilding, there was no more energy left for the asanas. And if you go, if the, the way that I was taught with the asanas, the asanas were put in place so people could sit longer, right? And meditate longer. Mm -hmm. And these monks were usually teenage boys, so they have lots of energy, so you have to burn the energy. So in essence, the way that I became content with this new practice was, I don't have any more energy to burn. It's gone. Sit right. and meditate and find the peace. And it was, and that was like m mind explosion. Well, and, and I, I think it's also important to remember that tapas can go hand in hand with any task, even something as mundane as cleaning or doing the laundry. We can bring this energy to all of those when we perform our actions with full determination and effort. And I know during that time that you were determined and you were putting a lot of effort out this out. So it's interesting to me that you feel like you struggle with that. I think we just have completely different perceptions of this energy because I'm also led by my work, but it's different every day. And that might look very scattered to some people, but it's the nature of how I work. And yeah there is this energy in that there is self-discipline in that um but you know sometimes that means sitting back and waiting for the energy to come through no so. I, I if i if i made you think that i was struggling with it i struggled with the physical practice and i thought that right. i was not being disciplined but the beautiful i guess enlightened idea that came about was the self-discipline doesn't have to be just wearing yourself out on the mat every day. It's just the dedication to improving and finding that peace that comes with your yeah. practice. But also, and, you, you know, you were helping others. You were taking food to people. You were in a state of service. And so to me, the act of giving ourselves to a higher purpose, a higher cause is the very root of tapas oh interesting you have been like well i can't go help these people because i have to do my physical practice right then you're not in alignment with the niyamas so to me you're kind of the embodiment of this my inspiration in this oh well thank you thank you thank you all right and so, so self-discipline Yes, self-discipline. Oh, Anything else on that? Tapas. Nope, tapas is self-discipline and fire. And so what is number four? It's Padyaya. I have a hard time saying. <laughs> That's why I like you saying it. Padyaya, Padyaya <laughs> sisterhood. Padyaya, you say it. <laughs> Spidyaya. That's how I would say it. Spidyaya. <laughs> we are not Sanskrit scholars. It means self-study. We are, we are laymen. We are laymen. Oh, uh, absolutely. What is it? Ph philosophical discoverers. We can well, say it I don't know if I'm a layman, but as far as like pronunciation of things, yeah. I mean, I have. I'm a Sanskrit I've layman. Delved, I've delved deep, deeply into the concepts. Um, but yeah, but yeah, yeah, still Southern. <laughs> what do you want from me? I'm Southern y'all. That's right. That's right. That's the, we, yeah. So self-study that has been interesting in light of the COVID crisis, at least, yeah. I don't know if it has been for you because we are here at home. We can't meet in person. So even at the studio, we were doing, um, virtual training. 
and yeah. virtual and we're doing it now virtual classes which it's the self practice right and i feel like the world is shifting a bit into this forced self study and i think that the, the those that are prepared and open and and accepting to this new reality of there's more in, independence even our students even our children more independent education more independent development self development those that are more open to it i think those are going to be the ones that are going to spring forward stronger and faster than those that have been like i don't like technology i'm not doing it i'm not doing it and i don't i'm curious to see what your thoughts are but i i just have this belief that this is the way that it's going to be and for those of us that are open to it and it's uncomfortable, no, it's not as good as having the teacher like looking over your shoulder to make well, sure you're doing your Well, that's the perception though. It can be as good. Yeah, I, I, agree. I agree. I have some clients that are very, very um, resistant to my phone and video sessions. I have several people who still love them and I'm, thankful thankful for my people because they've kept me working in these times of course there's not as much work because i can't rent my apartment on airbnb i can't bring people in can't do workshops right now that will all be coming back but you know i think that this this has gone to extremes for everyone and people are either really getting into themselves and they're you know, consciously, you know, contemplating and meditating on the self and becoming strong from within. Other people are kind of falling apart. I agree. I agree. And, and that's why. Yeah. And frankly, I think people are cycling through, you know, being okay, contemplating on the self and then losing it. So, you know, it's, it's a cycle, I think on some level for all of us, but I have found that the people are, who are going to come out of this the strongest are those people that are, you know, participating in the study of self. Yep. No, I, I totally 100% agree with you. Um, it's just like that in the studio, the folks that have transitioned well to this virtual study and have been there the whole time, their practices continue to grow, the relationships yeah that we are forming in these virtual environments, they're getting stronger and stronger, which is amazing and it's beautiful. And on the flip side of that, like you said, I have several clients that are like, nope, I'm not doing yeah. it. And, and, and you know what, that's okay. That they, they could be where they are. And if they need to, to go through this in that way, that's, that's fine. Um, I'm just really in a place of allowing everyone to be where they are through this. Um, and I know that soon we will be able to do those things again. I am less optimistic about that. I, I'm, I, yeah, we'll be able to open things up, but I don't think it's ever going to be the same. And I think that, that we have to get more accepting of these new ways of right. interacting with each other and right. new and ways of practicing. End up, yeah. Some people will end up preferring yeah. the online. Um, I agree. I think this is know, the future. There's nothing like sharing space in a yin class. Agreed. People I love, the people in my Thrive Tribe. So, you know, I'm sure that I'll come back to a balance of both, but I know that this time is moving me more into things that I can do as far as distance healing. And it happened when I moved my practice to Chattanooga. It's really my older clients that are struggling with the distance not the newer ones from here. Yep. No. So. And, and that's, that I think is a, is a testament to, you know, in general, uh, may, maybe like stereotypical, you know, resistance to change and no, it's, it's very, I think it's like that all across the board and right. just with the idea of being, and it's, you know, I'm not judging any, anybody for either of it, right. but I'm not I either. do. Yeah. I do think that those that are more open to it are going to reap the benefits of these. And there are benefits. I mean, you're right. There is nothing like being in a room full of people breathing in unity and moving in unity and, 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 and growing. Yeah. Growing. There is, 
we, I firmly believe God made us this assignment. He's jumping up behind us for those of you that are watching, for those of you that are watching, um, the, we were communal, we're, we're communal beings. We're not cats that are like, peace out. I don't care. You know, we're, we're communal people. Yeah. And I, and it's a beautiful thing and it's, it's very unnatural for us to be so taken away from each other. But I do think that if we are open to these new ways of sharing space, I think that that's going to prepare us more for the future. Cause this is well, and just the beginning. End up being, yeah. Part of the gift of all this is that we've yes. all kind of moved more into that. And people who were resistant before this have stepped up to the plate, you know? So no, I agree. Just do it in their own time. Yep. I agree. I a hundred percent and enjoy the so, journey. Yeah, but as far as self-study goes, you know, as a, just a recap, it's, we're acting in harmony with our goals and our, our deepest sense of purpose through aligning with our self, our divine self. It, that's what I, that's my description of it. Self-study for my description is the dedication to that exploration, the dedication to the deeper understanding of yourself, your relationship to the self, your relationship with the world. I, that to, that's kind of what that means to me. Yeah. And, you know, you're bringing that to your physical practice and you're studying yourself through the education of the poses and they, they get deeper and deeper meanings as you kind of tap into this and go along your journey they they're yep. going to be completely different when you're 24 than they're going to be when you're 55 oh yeah so. oh yeah no i totally agree with that all right the, next one is, is, the last one is yeah. vara pranadana as far pranadama i really enjoyed this one of course it was this the last one favorite. we did and I did it more from this place of deep contemplation than I had the luxury of in our earlier discussions, but it, it refers to, oh, I can't remember the literal translation, but I think it's to surrender to the Supreme, if I remember correctly. Yep. But it's a yep. surrendering. And it's a surrendering to the higher levels of consciousness, the, the reaching of the divine self through our practice and in our practice in our life. And I think we even talked about it a little bit last week, how it's like just being at peace with the circumstances that are going on and, and, and not fighting against it. Just like it says, surrendering, like there's a higher power at work. What, what, regardless what you believe, surrendering to the, the idea that all things are going to work out for the greater good and so right. fighting against it. Yes. Um, well, and that doesn't mean we just sit and don't act on things, but that we're doing it more from a place of this surrendering to the divine and allowing that to move your action. And surrendering to your calling too, right? Because it's not, it's all and, and even exactly. And exactly. And Deborah mentioned in the book, like, surrendering to your calling may be really hard and she mentioned the uh, a failed attempt at you know taking hitler's life um but that one spoke volumes to me especially in light of what all was going on because there have been several times where i just wanted to do this and go away and after the tornado hit it became very apparent to me that there was a there's something at place that we're supposed to be doing here. And we're, we're, we're here for a reason. If you don't believe it, look at the aerial shot, right? Of the studio where our roof was the only remaining roof, you know, and these buildings destroyed all around us. And the seeing that was the moment I think of clarity and surrender that no, you can't just wash your hands. There's something at play. You got to keep working. There is somebody has bigger plans for you. And, when that happened, the, there was a burden lifted because before I was, it was like trudging along to try to manage all of these moving pieces. And after that realization happened, you know, sometimes it's, it's, 
you, you, like, I've always loved teaching the yoga or teaching in general, but when, once it was like that, Hey, you know, wake up dummy, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Then, then it became a little bit easier to stomach the, the issues that are surrounding life today for me. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's very profound to me to think about this journey we've been on through these with the radical shift of what's happened in the past six weeks. Agreed. The world has changed. I love how we have this as a guide for us because, you know, the sages tell us and the mystics guide us to wholeness that, that the way to wholeness and fulfillment is through our inward quest. And these niyamas are all very connected to that root nature that we all are. And I have loved it. Me too. Me too. Thank you for studying it with me. Oh, thank you for studying it with me. I've enjoyed exploring it with you and the insights and growth that we've both had have been profound and thank you all for sharing it with us and next week we're going to stretch this out one more time and do an overview of the whole journey and my goal is to watch all of the videos again that we've made and kind of you know look back on it very concretely and share with you all my insights on that so I, I love it. I'll join you in that goal. That'll okay. be fun. Yeah. And we can, we can laugh at me making fun of my poor son trying to potty train. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for being with us. Please like us on all the podcasts and YouTube channels. Yes, definitely hit subscribe and you can find out more about us at thriveyogaandwellness.com and theenergycenter.com through Facebook or Instagram. Please check me out. Thank you so much for joining us. We can't wait to see you next week. Bye-bye.